evening, here is the news. President Tito arrived at London Airport earlier this evening on the first stage of his five-day visit to the... <laughs> Somebody's still in the news. <laughs> well, there you are, then. Uh, well, that's very interesting. Who said that? It wasn't me. No. Well, it must have been me, then. I thought I recognised the voice. <laughs> and that was something completely different. <laughs> Society, because you see, oh, ah, very kindly, kindly, thank you. Thank you. Alan, 
I have so far paid my late wife, I'm sorry, my ex-wife, $22 million. I have $2 million more to go. But my Californian lawyer tells me that I go off lightly. He says, think how much more you would have had to pay her had she contributed anything to the relationship. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you all for the contribution of you. <laughs> so let me, let me uh, tell you about me. I began on the 27th of October 1939, just after the outbreak of World War II, in a small seaside town in the southwest of England called Western Super Bear. And the happiest moment I had in the whole of Monty Python was one morning at Terry Jones' house. We had a read through all the stuff we'd written the previous week, and I read out for the first time the cheese shop sketch, and Michael made him laugh so much he couldn't stop. He completely lost it. He slid off his chair <laughs> and lay there and wounded. <laughs> <laughs> For me, that was the best year, best moment in five years of unemployment. But the word that we all used about what we were doing was silly. We loved this word silly, and it was so great just to be as silly as we wanted. You know, if we were writing an interview sketch, instead of writing one like the one with Marty with an interviewee, we would interview a duck. <laughs> Or something along that way. I once talked to you and Graham Chapman in, in a dress in his pipe. <laughs> he replied, Well, I'd like to answer that question in two ways. First, in my normal voice, and then in his silly hard to explain how it is. Liberating, just being as silly as we like. And when I asked the Pythons a couple of years ago what was the silliest thing we ever did, the answer was unanimous the fish slapping dance. <laughs>
three or four drawers like that in the middle. middle <laughs> <laughs> about 15, 20 feet away, I thought to myself, I cannot believe that he does not hear it. And I said, yeah, this is wonderful. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> he said, he turned and walked towards me. I thought, oh, he's seen me. And he came up the mirror and said, I couldn't reach through and touched him. And then he walked away and he started undressing. Oh, God, I thought he had a camera. He'd be so surprised at the boy, you know. And, and, and then he um, put his pajamas on and he brushed his teeth and he brushed his hair. And then he got into bed and he tucked himself up and he put his glasses on and he got his book out and he started to read in this corner and realized that the joke is now on me. <laughs> <laughs>
50 fucking years. <laughs> if you start telling me all the things that made her life miserable, I think we'll finish up more depressed than she was. So on one occasion, inspiration struck. One day she was carefully listing all the reasons why she didn't want to go on living, and I heard myself say, Mother, I have an idea. And she said, oh, oh what is that? And I said, well, I know a little man who lives in Fulham. And if you're still feeling this way next week, I can give him a call if you like, but only if you like. And he could come down to Western Super Mare and kill you. And the first night we arrived, we all went down to the dining room for dinner, and we all sat around the same table, and for the very first time, I noticed the owner, Mr. Donald Sinclair, who became the model for Basil Fawlty. And he was walking around the dining room like this, you know, Lord of all he surveyed, not helping or anything, and he walked past the dining table, and he suddenly stared at Terry Gilliam, because Terry, had ordered a steak, and Terry's American, so he ate a steak as the Americans ate it. He cut the meat up in the right hand, and then he put the knife down, he took the fork in the right hand, and he speared the meat, and ate it like that, and Mr. Sinclair stared at him, and then he said, we don't eat like that in this country. <laughs> Next morning, all the pythons left to stay at the Imperial Hotel, but Connie and I stayed on, and I don't know why, maybe it was inertia. Or maybe it was curiosity, because Mr. Mr. Sinclair was the most gloriously rude man I knew. <laughs> he would sit at the reception desk, just staring at his face, and then he would sense a guest coming and immediately pretend he was going to go with them. They'd walk over to the desk, and eventually they'd say, Excuse me, he'd say, Oh, what? <laughs> One morning, I left my briefcase. Uh, by the front door and the car came to collect me, I just forgot it. So uh, when I got back that evening, I wanted to get it back, so I walked into the hotel, he sees me coming, he immediately pretends he's busy, so I walk up to him and I say, excuse me, he says, oh, what is it now? I said, I left my briefcase. And he said, yeah, it's over there, it's over there behind the white wall. And he points out at the front door of the hotel, and there's a swimming pool out there, and about 70 yards away, there's a white wall. <laughs> I said, what? He said, well, I'm trying to run a hotel here. I said, well, 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 why did you put it behind the white wall? He said, we thought there might be a bomb in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, a bomb? And he said, and I promise you, he really said this. He says, well, we had some star problems recently. <laughs> <laughs> Connie and I stayed there. He gave us all the material we ever needed for both series. The only thing we had to change was Mr. Sinclair's size. 
because he was actually quite small, and his wife was quite big. So when Connie and I wrote Fulton Towers three years later, we made Basil's fear of Sybil his single strongest motivation, much more important than his bad temper or his snobbery or his rudeness. The script of the average BBC half-hour sitcom is about 65 pages long. We used to do 135 to 140 pages, more than twice as many. Our average sitcom would have 200 camera cuts, we had about 450. So it was an enormous amount to learn in just four days rehearsal and one day in the studio practicing with the cameras. And in the whole of Forty Towers, all 12 episodes, we never completed a single dress rehearsal. That's how frantic it was. So the only reason that it looks as good as it does is that we spent an extraordinary amount of time um, editing. You know, just taking out the pause there, a little fluff there, and we take that out, and we tighten that up there, and we get the whole thing going along at a crisp pace. And I want to show you an example of this, which just happens to be my favourite moment in the whole series. And it might surprise you, it's the fire drill. <laughs> because there's always been something ridiculous to me about staging a fire drill exactly when everyone knows that it's going to happen. You know? <laughs> then Connie and I added an extra idea, and that is that the burglar alarm on the safe goes off by accident just before the drill is due to begin. You know where it is? So she has to come along and move them down the so that I can't find the Well, once she put that on, all I wanted to get Sorry, Miss Tibbs. What? Uh, that was the bag, Roland. The fire goes on for a couple of minutes. Sorry. Excuse me. Uh, no, no. Uh, my wife left the. Uh, excuse me. Yes? Uh, sorry, that wasn't the fire bell. Sorry, that was just the. Uh... No, I thought it was a drill. Yes, there is at 12 o'clock, but not yet. But it is 12 o'clock. Well, not quite. Thank you. Excuse me. <laughs> well, I make it. Uh, I'm afraid that wasn't the. What uh... time do you make it, Major? Look, that was a bell, I think. Look, it doesn't matter what time he makes it, it hasn't started yet. Sure. It hasn't started yet. But that was the bell, wasn't it? No. He means the drill at the start. What the twat, we didn't hear a drill. No, 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 look, look. <laughs> See? The burglar alarm. Yes. Oh, the burglar. Everything. No, no, what's the matter with you all? It's perfectly simple. We had the fire drill when I ring the fire bell. That wasn't the fire bell, right? Well, how are we supposed to know that wasn't the fire bell? Because it doesn't sound like the fire bell. <laughs> Accurate 
Arthur Trail, and Mrs. Sinclair was about five or six years ago. Mrs. Sinclair, by now sadly a widow, was interviewed by a British national newspaper, and she finally spoke out. She said, <clears throat> the portrayal of my husband was a travesty, she said. He was a perfect English gentleman, a war hero, and we ran the hotel very efficiently. He was nothing like Basil Faldi at all. The next day, the letters started pouring in, not just, not just from former guests, but from the Sinclair's old employees. Each letter said, no, no, he was exactly like that. <laughs> Keep the bucket, pop the twig, hit the bus, snuff it, breathe his last, and go out to be the great head of light entertainment in the sky. <laughs> and I guess that we're all thinking how sad it is that a man of such talent, of such capability for kindness, of such unusual intelligence, should now so suddenly be spirited away at the age of only 48 before he achieved many of the things of which he was capable and before he had enough fun. Well, I feel that I should say not good riddance to him, the freeloading bastard I know he's The reason I feel I should say this he would never forgive me if I didn't, if I threw, threw away this glorious opportunity to shock you all on his behalf. <laughs> Anything for him but mindless good taste. I could hear him whispering in my ear last night as I was writing this, all right please, he was saying, you're very proud of being the very first person ever to say shit on British television. If this service is really just for starters, I want you to become the first person ever at a British memorial service to say fuck. <laughs> Every single one of them said fuck. <laughs> <laughs>